Welcome to Valley Grove Baptist Church, located at 1731 South, U.S. Highway 281 in Stephenville, Texas. We are glad you joined us for our 1030 Sunday morning worship service. If you'd like to learn more about Valley Grove, please check us out at our website at valleygrove.net. Now, join us for the morning worship service already in progress. Pocket in front of you. 
in there has got some information about us, but also a section that you can fill out, tear off, and put that in the offering plate. Let that be your gift to us today. Hope that you'll do that, but we're certainly glad that you're here to visit. Hey, if you've got your bulletins, take this card out. Wave it like this, okay? Come on. They're not going to let me do it yet. Come on. Take your card out. Wave it like this. Okay, as you wait, if that is a signal to me that, yes, Brother Lord, I agree to write each one of these missionaries this week, okay? All right. Hey, these are just some, but these are the, uh, the ones that we can write to and make connection with some of the summer missionaries that we are helping to partner with. And it's not only partnering with our, with our financial gifts that help to send them. We partner with them in prayer. We want to partner with them in encouragement. And so Brother Mark has given us the addresses. And so, hey, write them a little card, a little note of encouragement and prayer. It would make their day. It would make their day. And we want to bless them in that way. So please take advantage of this card. Write them a quick note of encouragement as they are out there sharing the gospel around the world uh, on, on behalf of not only Valley Grove, but the kingdom of God. So please take advantage of this. All right? You wait with your, your committee. Okay? You good? All right? Everybody with me. Everybody say glory. Glory. Oh, amen. Hey, let's stand and greet one another love of Christ. Glad you're here this morning.
She takes another bucket. That would that would be tricky. That would be tricky of me. God's love. Well, I think God's love is everywhere, so yes, it's in the bucket. But technically, visually, that's not what we can see in the bucket. Why can't why can't we see what's in the bucket? Yeah, it's blocked up. It's covered up. I've concealed it. All right, let's see what's in the bucket. Uh, Jake and Emma, can y'all come up and let's see what's in the bucket? <coughs> oh, it's light. For shine. Oh, we can leave it. <laughs> okay, so we couldn't see what was in the bucket because we concealed it and covered it up. Do you guys know that's kind of how God's love is in us, inside of us? We have God's love inside of us. You know, we, we know what God wants us to do. We know how immense and incredible God's love is. But we can hide it. We can keep it inside of us and hide it and not share it with anybody else. We can conceal it. But is that what God wants us to do? He wants us to share it. He wants us to be brave and take risks and share His, God, His love with people. And sometimes that's scary. Sometimes that means sitting next to somebody that you don't know. Sometimes that means taking a risk that somebody might not be nice to you. Do we only share God's love with people that are nice to us? People that aren't nice to us sometimes are the ones that need it the most. They need God's love the most. And you guys are the way, one of the ways that God shows that love. He uses you to show other people's love. So I want you to invite people to be yes. And kids that are coming to BBS that maybe don't go to our church or we don't know them, invite them. Because guess what? Last year, my kids came to BBS. And we weren't members here. We were new. We were trying it out. And when I came in, all the adults that greeted me made me feel so welcome. They already felt like home. And my kids left and said, oh, I know so many kids there. They were so nice. So last year, BBS Kids really made my kids feel special and made them feel like this was a great place to be. And then guess what? Here we are. We're part of the family now. So let's make other people feel that way tonight as they come in. Let's welcome them and show them God's love and, and be the light for Him. Shine and show God's love. Okay. Let's uh, close our eyes and pray. Lord, thank you so much for these kids and thank you so much for this church. This church is such a blessing in my family's life. And I thank you for all the love that they show the community and to each other. Help us stay focused tonight on the real purpose of BBS, which is to show God's love and to shine for Him in our community. Be with all the teachers and the workers tonight and help us to, to show His love to these kids. Amen. Amen. Let's stand in for worship and let's sing about the days of Elijah. Sing about us and be the ones who take the message of Elijah.
know, he says right there in that, in that song, he says, We are the labor, laborers in the vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. We are the ones that are take the word out to that vineyard, out to that uh, group of people that we come in contact with to declare the word of the Lord. We're going to read our scripture for today, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 8, the first part of that. And uh, I'm going to read that for you. Read along with me on the screen. It says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved brother, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in the word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we are among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia and all who believe. From whom, for from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. And that's what we're supposed to do, sound forth the word. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that we have a hope within us. We thank you, Lord, that we have something to tell the lost and dying world. God, thank you for the church at Thessalonica and how they were faithful, how they were people of love, and how they were people of work, that they took this, this hope, Lord, to the lost people around them. God, I pray that as we see those around us, God, that we will do what you have given us that to do. God, you've given us talents, you've given us gifts, you've given us the ability, Lord, some of us different abilities, some of us different gifts to spread the gospel to people. God, help us not to hide it in a bucket. Help us not to hide it by being ashamed. Help us not to hide it by being uh, scared. But Lord, help us to share it with boldness. God, even a small light can be seen very far away. And I pray, God, that we can be lights for you wherever we go. For it's in your name we pray. Let's stand together and sing the song, I Will Follow You. It's a challenge to us to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust Him in the path that needs to lead us to follow Him. All your ways are good, all your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight, higher above.
Christ. How many of y'all was someone in church? Was it someone a faithful church member? Maybe a Sunday school teacher, a preacher? All right. Okay. A good number of you. How many of y'all was just someone out of the blue, a co-worker? Maybe it was outside of the church. It was somewhere just on the street somewhere. How many of y'all would say that was you? All right. All right. Good. Now, no matter where that is, that where, no matter where it is, it's somewhere that God is taking, telling that person to spread the gospel with you, whether it's at church where we come faithfully on Sunday and Wednesday night, that person is taking the gospel to those little boys and girls, to those adults. But you know, also out on the streets, also in the workplaces, people, we are to take the gospel to those people. And these are testimonies of those who were, the gospel was spread and told to them about, about a, a, a Jesus Christ who died for their sins. And I believe right now, church, that there's a lost and dying world outside these walls. The city of Stephenville, or wherever you are coming here from, that needs to hear about the gospel, needs to hear about Jesus Christ. This next song says he's the God of this city. And it talks about how we're supposed to take that message of Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world. I want you to think about the person who told you about Jesus Christ and think about how they boldly spoke that message of Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world. And how we're supposed to take that outside to the man, to the lost world. You're the God of this city.
believe that. If you believe that there is no one like our God, then you'll do exactly what that song says. And you'll take His name to the city. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You so much for the opportunity to come to You in prayer. And God, there is no one like You. God, You are the one who can save a lost and dying world. But yet, Lord, I think we forget about that. We get so comfortable in these pews. And we get comfortable in the seats. And we get so excited about praise and worshiping you in these four walls that we forget that there is a lost world beside us that is perishing, that is hurting, that needs the light, that feels no hope. And yet we have the cure for those who are feel hopeless. I just pray that you burden our hearts to share the gospel. Lord, whether it's in just telling them that you love them, whether it's just coming alongside them and just encouraging them, praying for them, God, help us not to be complacent. Help us to shine through you. You are worthy, Father. You are the answer. God, forgive us for keeping our mouths shut and being quiet. Help us to be quiet no longer. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do today in this place. We thank you, God. For all that you've done, God, I pray for our pastor as he brings forth the word of God here in a few moments that you give him boldness. God, I pray for this offering. I pray, God, that you bless the gift and the giver today. God, I just pray that people will know the hope that is in us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I should you come forward for our offering, please. I should you come forward. to 
things come very naturally to you. But there are gifts that God gives us that requires us to help develop them, that requires us to grow into them. It's not that it's not a giftedness by God. It is a giftedness. The ability to learn and to grow in that. But He's asking for a little more of us in the process of growth in that area. We remember back again to uh, earlier study in Ephesians as we continue to continue this letter from the Pastor Paul uh, to the church at Ephesus. That he, God made very clear the intent and purpose of the church was to make God known. And we continue to have that umbrella, that understanding there, that the purpose of us as believers, the, our purpose as a whole and as individuals, is to make God known. And we've been talking about how we're going to go about doing that. This morning we're going to continue in that study of fulfilling that purpose and making God known. As we begin, let's, let's join together in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day, excited for all that this week holds. But Father, here and now, we dedicate this time specifically to the study of your word. We, we call it holy, set it apart, asking for you to help us set it apart in our minds. Removing distraction. we got so many things going on. But Father, here in this time, we want to hear from you. So we proclaim this time as yours. And we yield our minds to you. We yield our attention to you. We yield our hearts to you and our ears. So help us to hear what you want to say to each of us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have your Bibles. Open them up. We're going to continue on in Ephesians 4. We're going to pick up where we left off last time. We went through verse 10 last time. So we'll pick up Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11. We're going to cover verses 11 through 16. So let's read them all together and then we'll circle back around. So Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11. It was He, it was Christ, who gave some to be apostles. Remember earlier it says, uh, Paul told us that to each one of us grace has been given. Gifts have been given as Christ apportioned it. Okay, so it continues on here in verse 11. It was Christ who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of men and their de deceitful schemes. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is the head, that is Christ Jesus. From Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Well, let's begin walking through these verses. He says there in verse 11, he gives us some of the giftedness, some of the, basically the, the pastoral leadership that he has assigned to the church. These roles are to be fulfilled. And then he says in verse 12, the reason he has given these roles, these gifts, is to prepare God's people for works of service. Now, I love all the different translations of Scripture that there are. In fact, whenever I study, I generally have four different translations open, as well as the, the Greek and Hebrew uh, open for, for the verses. I love the King James Version. King James Version in, in, as, as, a, as, a, as a translation is what we would call a, a, a wooden translation. In, in, in other words, it's more word for word. It, it tries to take Greek word translated into English word. And, just, and so it's, it's just very much that way. And so sometimes we attribute the, the hard reading to the old King James as because of its old English. Some of that. But more so it's because its, it's intended purpose is to try to translate from word for word as best it can. Okay? Now some translations do it differently. NIV, for example, translates not really word for word as much as it is idea for idea. Sentence for sentence. Thought for thought. And so it tries to take a thought that is contained in a sentence, and so it may put the wording in a different order, or use of different words and descriptions, because it's trying to convey the idea that the original uh, Greek or Hebrew text is trying to convey. So it comes at it from a little different approach. Most of the uh, translations try to come at it from one of those two approaches. Now there are things other than translations you have in, in uh, uh, the, the Message and in the Living Bible, paraphrases. And oftentimes, really particularly with these two, what you find is, is one person, not a committee or team, but one person, 
And they're trying to, to translate the scripture into something that either their children can read or something that's just a little easier to understand for others. They have a little more freedom in conveying thoughts because they're paraphrasing, not translating. Now it's important to know these things as we begin to study God's Word. It's also important to, to understand that in, that in man's translations, there are times that, that we, may, uh, we may hiccup uh, in, in those translations, so it's important for us to go back to the Greek uh, and Hebrew text and gain a, a greater understanding of what's happening. This is one of those instances where it's tripped up the church in the past. In verse 12, if you have if you have a original King James, not a new King James translation, what's the, what is there in your Bible right after the word saints in verse 12? Or. Okay, is there something between saints and four? A comma. There's a comma. There's a comma. So in other words, if you read it in that original King James, it reads like this. Well, I'll read it in the end. That the purpose of the, the leadership of the church is to prepare God's people or equip God's people, comma, works of service, and so on. Well, what's happening in the King James translation there is it is a comma has been inserted, and so it makes it sound like that God has given us leadership to equip God's people, to perform works of service, and to build up the body. And when you go back to the original Greek, though, that comma is not there. And so really this, this reading that should happen there is that God has given us leadership in order to prepare God's people for works of service. It's not that just the, perform, the works of service are performed by the leadership, but it, it, there's a preparation and equipping that happens because all of God's people should be involved in the works of service. Okay? Now that's somewhat of a side note, but I say that uh, as an understanding because if you read it, you see that comment that Paul's is probably best understood not to be there. Again, I love all the translations, but I want to read them all together to, bring the, to gain the fullest understanding. And so I say, first of all, hey, let's be aware of the comma, because what I believe the intention of God's Word is, is in this. I have given roles, I have given responsibilities, and to the, to the responsibility I've given to the church leadership is this, to equip the people for works of service. Now, do the, does the leadership participate in that? Absolutely. But they don't fly solo in that. It's important that we all as believers understand that we have all been commended and commissioned to go and do the works of service that God has planned for us to do. Amen? Amen. That's a mirroring of Ephesians 2.10, which it says, For we have been saved uh, by grace through faith. Not of ourselves, a gift from God. But he also tells us that we are God's work. workmanship created to do the things that he has planned for us to do. Years ago, I was reading and studying there in Acts 6. In Acts 6, it's, it's part of the selection to the early church of, of deacons uh, to help and, and uh, do the service and work of the church. And there's a phrase in that that just kind of always, it kind of went sideways whenever it got in my throat. It just kind of like, you know, this doesn't sound great. It doesn't sound right. The, the actual the apostles said to people, said, you seven men from among you. He said, you know, because we need help. But the way they said it was this, we don't need to be spending our time waiting tables. We need to be spending our time in, in the Word and in prayer. And what they said was absolutely right. But in some ways it's like, oh man, it sounded like, well, this has greater importance than this and everything else. Really what they're saying is, this is the role that God has given us. We need, to, we need to spend our time and attention in the role that God has given us. But we also understand that these things need to be done. This last Sunday, our deacon body began deacon examinations as we continue in the, in the process of, of moving towards ordination. And, and Brother Buddy Lassiter, chairman of the deacons day, he, he referred to this verse in, in Acts 6. And he, he did so, in, 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 if you will, paraphrase it in a beautiful way. He said, you know, in that early church, there was so much going on. So they were growing so fast. There was so much ministry needing to be done that the early apostles said, hey, we need some help. We need some more guys to come in here and help us do the ministry that needs to be done that we're just not having time to get to. I said, you know what? That's exactly right. I mean, that's exactly what that verse says and means. And God in His plan knew that that would be the case. There's going to be so much happening in my church, God says. I'm going to give some roles and assign some leadership, but there's going to be so much going on. They can't do it by themselves. It's got to be all believers pitching all in because of all that needs to be done. That's what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 4. It's going to take all believers coming in.
coming in all together to get all of it done. And church, I want to say, first of all, thank you. Because I experienced that kind of participation here at Valley Grove. And I tell you from a pastor's heart how beautiful and rewarding it is to see the people of God join in. Everybody grab a hold of the rope. Everybody pulling and doing their part. That's the way God designed it. That's the way it needs to be. And in a healthy church, that's the way it works. And praise God, we experience that here at Valley Grove. I thank you for that. I charge us to continue, but I thank you that it is happening. We're going to have a great VBS this week. I mean, they have worked hard in, in preparing. They have worked hard in getting ready and decorating and everything. They're going to work hard in the teaching and in the singing and in the sharing of the gospel. And I want to tell you pastorally, I've done nothing. I've done nothing. And it will be a great VBS because the ones that God has led to jump in there with that, they're going to do great work. Now, Brother Rob and Jeremy, they, they've, had, they've had their hands in there, they've helped out, they've done some things, but there have been others step up and take those roles. That's what God has said needs to happen, and that's what's happened. A few weeks ago, we had a couple of informational meetings. One was on the archery ministry that we were wanting to, to look at getting started. Another was on the light mechanics work ministry that we want to talk about getting started. I didn't even get to sit in on the light mechanics work ministry. I told them, I said, guys, you take it and run with it. Whatever it needs to be, whatever God leads you to do, do. They came out of the meeting. They had a date set for the first time that they would do it. I wasn't in the meeting. I wasn't part of it. Helped set it up. They took it and ran. We're sitting in the archery ministry and kind of laying it out and telling the guys what you know what they say it looks like. And I just so much potential. I'm so excited. We have a segment of our church and our, our fifth and sixth grade boys we want to focus on first because I think that's a great contact point. But there's so much more that can happen. This with the girls, the teenager, with men outside the church that, that so much God can do with this. But I looked at them and said, I'll be honest with you, I don't have time. God has intention in so much, in so many other ways. I can't pull myself into this. I think it needs to happen. I want it to happen, but I can't do it. I said, I need you guys to step up and take ownership in it. The guys running the table said, we'll do it. We've got it. We'll run with it. That's the sign of a healthy church. That's the plan that God has laid out. That there is leadership roles, yes, but it's everybody pitching in. Everybody getting busy. Everybody pulling on the rope. Because everybody is needed. How many of you used to watch that show, One Versus a Hundred? Anybody? I watched it a few times, not a lot, but there's this one contestant answering question. There's a, a hundred, a panel of a hundred people up there, and for him to win the ultimate, he's got to defeat the hundred, if I remember right. Yeah? Well, that's a big task for one person to defeat a hundred. Well, think about that in, in terms of the church. What if all that the plan was was for, for leaders in the church to be the only ones that evangelize? Well, instead of having 100, 200, 300 people going out there and inviting people, what if there's just one, two, or three? Well, coverage is not going to be there. All the, the interactions that, that happen in the hundreds now are just happening in the single digits. But see, here we, we invite ourselves to say, hey, we want to participate in all that God has planned. We want to participate in, in the inviting, in the sharing of the gospel. And so we ask ourselves, have you invited someone to church? Have you said a good word about the Lord? Have you seen the need and met that need in the name of Christ? Why? Because all of us are called to participate. We're putting our hand on the rope before. Praise the Lord we do. Because instead of one, two, or three invites a week, the, inv the invitations are in the hundreds. They said one, two, or three, and reaching out and saying, hey, I want you to come and experience the presence of God with us. I want you to come and study God's Word with us. That's happening in the hundreds. And we see the results of it. God is growing us in a mighty way because I believe we're faithful to the plan that He has. I've mentioned just a few, but you can look around in, in the children's ministries on Wednesday nights or on Sunday nights. You can see it in our Sunday school classes. You can see it throughout all of our ministries. You can see it in our senior adult ministries our youth and all these all these things where people are pitching in. Because God has gifted you and God has called you and that is part of God's plan in the church being what the church is called to be. Amen? God tells us that here in Ephesians 4. But He goes on to give us three ways that this is manifested. 
He says that He has given us leadership to prepare God's people for works of service so that because of this preparation, because of this equipping, but also because of us all jumping in together and doing that, what God's called us to do, the body of Christ may be built up, will be built up until we've all reached unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Let's pause for a moment and look at those three things. God tells us that whenever we have this equipping and when we have this buy-in where all of us are participating and helping out, He said three things basically will happen. The first He says is that we'll be strengthened spiritually by unity of the faith. You realize that we're not all here just because we like each other. Amen? You didn't know whether to say amen or not. I, well, I mean, that's the truth. I mean, that, that's not the reason we're all here. We're not all here because we're Jackets fans. Amen? Or Texans fans. Amen? Why are we here? We're here because we're united in Christ. Amen? Amen. amen. That's what draws us together. And that unity of the faith can never be lost. We're not here because everything is perfect. You're just exactly like me. And I like what you like. This. We're here because we're Christians. We're here because we have proclaimed Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives. Amen? Amen? And that is a tie that binds us together for now and for all eternity. And it's a truth we can never let go of. And it's a truth that holds us firmly together. Paul reminds us here that whenever we have this equipping and when we have this joining together in works of service, that part of the, the outcome of that is a unity in the faith. These deep spiritual beliefs that we hold, we hold to because of the truth taught to us in Scripture. We don't give those things up. Here in the uh, beginning of the Wednesdays in July, we're going to begin a, a new study for a few weeks on Baptist distinctions or Baptist beliefs. And I think for some of you it's going to be some reminders. For others it's like, oh, okay, well, you know what does make us Baptist? When we say that, what does that mean? What is it that we hold to? Now, they're not things that are just so far. They're, they're things based on Scripture. But we want to study those and know those things. Why? Because it's part of what binds us together. As far as I know, other than fried chicken, there's nothing that holds Baptists together that's outside of Scripture. Okay? Casseroles you may be included. I don't think they have casseroles on the time. But outside of those two things, everything that binds us together as Baptists is scriptural. But we want to study those things and know those things. Because our, our connection is through Christ and nothing else. If it's not because of Christ, then we're nothing more than social. But that's not what we are. We are brothers and sisters. Heirs with Christ, heirs of the Heavenly Father. Amen? And part of the equipping that happens, and part of us join, the part of what happens when we join together in works of service is that we're reminded and we're strengthened in our unity of faith. There's a second thing that happens, Paul says, and that is that we're strengthened and built up not only because of our unity in the faith, but because of our knowledge of the Son. See, when we come together, it's not only that we are united by our faith in Christ, but we study the life of Christ to be strengthened in our likeness of Christ. And see, part of the thing that we commit to is memberships, so and part of what we commit to in this body of believers is that, hey, we want to grow in our knowledge and likeness of Christ. Now, for some of you, that's one of the places where you need to work on. That's one of the places where you kind of you kind of pull back. Attendance and worship, good. Claiming of, of Christ as Lord of your life, good. That unity of the faith, that's good. But knowledge of the Son, you kind of said, hey, you know, I've got good enough knowledge. I'll come to what I get in worship. will be good enough, but I'll just kind of stall right there. That's not what Paul's, what Paul calls us to be in the church. He calls us to be increasing, to be strengthening in our knowledge of the Son, which in other words means he calls us to be students of Scripture. He calls us to be studiers of God's Word. I don't know what the priority list in your life is of the reading of God's Word. I hope and pray that it's high. And if it's not, I hope today is a reset for you that says, you know what, I'm going to raise the priority of being a student of God's Word. Why? Because being a student of God's Word increases our knowledge of the Son, increases the likelihood of that likeness in us coming forward. How can we mirror the life of Christ if we don't study the life of Christ? 
How can we mirror the ways of God if we don't study the ways of God? We need to be a people of the book. We need to be readers of God's Word and doers of God's Word, but we need to be students of God. Amen? I mean, that's what the word disciple means, right? It's to follow along behind someone, study their ways and their lives, and then strive to live like them. If we're going to be calling ourselves disciples of Christ, we need to be disciples of Christ. I need to be a better student of God's Word. You need to be a better student of God's Word. It's part of that strengthening that God calls us to do and to be. Never be satisfied with how much you know of God's Word. Because I promise you there's more to learn. And not just learning of His Word, but learning of Him. I told you all this before. One of the things I love about premarital counseling it is sitting down and telling the couple, say, listen, you're going to know this person, your mate, unlike anybody else in the world. And they're going to know more things about you than anybody else in the world is. That's part of that beauty of two becoming one. They're going to know things about you, how you tick, what you like, what you don't like. And it's such a beautiful thing when that comes together. And you get to love each other out of that knowledge because you've studied your mate. You know how they tick. You know what they like. And then you live out of that love and knowledge of them. Really, that's just supposed to mirror how we live with God. God, I want to study your ways. I want to know you. What do you like? What do you dislike? Because I want to live in love in those things. We need to study God. To know those things about Him. And to live out of that knowledge and out of that love. There's a third thing that Paul says happens whenever we join together. The equipping of the church and the joining together in works of service. And that he says, that is, he says, maturity happens. A maturity happens. A maturity in our faith. Look at verse 14 again with me. He says, then we'll no longer be like infants tossed back and forth by the waves or blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful schemes. Times pass, if I preached on this, I grabbed one of my kids whenever they were smaller and everything, and I said, you know, as me, a big an adult man and everything, I take this child, it's not hard for me to influence them moving. I can move them from side to side, kind of such as it is when that little child gets in the ocean and they get out there in the waves and the waves hit them and they go stumbling back because they just don't have that firm footing. They don't have that, that maturity in their body to be able to withstand the waves. But as they grow in their bodies and they get stronger and as adults get out there, they learn to brace themselves and they see the waves coming and they, they can withstand them. Because there's a maturity that's happened in their body. Well, such as it needs to be in our faith, Paul says. We need to be maturing in our faith so that we're growing, so that we can brace ourselves whenever the, the, the ways of the world come at us or whenever this new teaching that is actually contradictory to God's Word comes at us. We stand strong because we know what it is. We've matured in our faith and our understanding of God. And so we can withstand this false teaching. If we never mature in our faith and all of a sudden somebody says something and they throw in the word God and they throw in the word love or they throw in the word Jesus and they're like, hey, I'm hooked. That sounds good to me. Let's believe in that. Let's follow that. But we need to be mature so that we can withstand those things. We can go to the word of God and say, hey, that's in agreement with God's word. I like that. That's true. That's right. Well, that's contradictory to his word. Slipping through the channels late one night a few weeks ago and, and there's a uh, worship time on uh, on TV two or three in the morning. <laughs> Basic theme of the whole hour was if you'll plant a seed of a thousand dollars, you'll see that blossom and grow in your life in exponential way. But you need to plant that seed. I was watching that same program a, a couple weeks later, and the message was still the same. Now, there's a part of scripture that God says, "Test me." with your tithes and offerings and see if I can't be trusted, see if I don't grow up in the storehouses of heaven. Absolutely. Beautiful truth in God's Word. Test Him in your tithe and see if He does not provide in ways that you can't imagine. God's Word is true in that. But you know what? That was the only message of that program. That was not a, a, a mature message or a, a message to try to mature you in your faith. That was a message of trying to get your money out of your pocket and put it into theirs. And unfortunately, there are many of those kind of things happening on the airwaves. They'll take some of God's Word and they'll twist it. And they'll wrench it. And they'll turn it so it can say just what they want it to say. And they'll put it out to you. And if you don't have the maturity, the knowledge of God's Word, to go and search out if that is really the truth of His Word, 
But what you find yourself is like that child tossing the ocean. Oh, this sounds good. That sounds good. And by every false claim that's coming, we're just blown in a little different direction. Blown in a different way. God said what should happen is that in the equipping that happens in the body of believers, and we're all putting all in. We're, we're pouring in and works of service and working with each other and we're studying with each other. And what's happening is we're growing in the unity of our faith, in our knowledge of Christ, and in our maturing in the faith and understanding of God's Word. Those are the things that need to happen in the church. Those aren't suggestions. That's actually the, the layout of God's plan. That's what God says happens in the healthiness of the fellowship of His. You know what? I think in many ways God is pleased with what's happening. But there's always room to grow. There's always room to get stronger. There's always places that we need to be mature. There's also the understanding that God is constantly bringing new ones among us. And so together we need to arrive at those places. That building up and strengthening never stops. 1 Timothy 3.15 there, Paul calls the church the pillar and the foundation of truth. It's this idea that, that the church is, is the guardian of the foundation of truth. Well, if the church doesn't know the truth of God, how in the world is it going to be the foundation of truth for the world to build on? How in the world is it going to be the guardian of that truth for the world to come to see and know and learn? Paul committed the Bereans. Because when after he would preach, they would go home at night and study the scriptures to see if what he said was true. I give you permission. Every Sunday, go home and search the scriptures. And if I have misspoke in any place, please let me know. I would be tickled to death to hear from you. Not because I speak perfectly. I know I speak imperfectly many times. But I want us as a church to be so about God's Word and seeking the truth that we go and search His Word to verify or affirm the truth being told to us. We need to be the students of God's Word in that way. Why? Because the world seeks to rob us of that truth. The world seeks to, to tell you there are loopholes, there are different ways to God. It's, it's many paths to the same mountaintop, whatever metaphor they want to use. But God's Word tells us very clearly that Jesus is the only way. The only way that a man will be saved is if he calls on the name of Christ to forgive him of his sins, to be Lord of his life. There's no other name by which people are saved. Except the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And these are truths that we have to hold firmly to, that we have to know and we have to claim. Well, let's circle back around. We began this by talking about gifts. Each one of you that has claimed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life have been given at least one spiritual gift. And of that spiritual gift or all the gifts that God has given you, you are responsible to the Lord for the use of that gift. He's given you that gift for the purpose of fulfilling the purpose of the church, that is to making God known. Are you using the gift, gifts that God has given you? Because if you're not, today we need to pause and make a recommitment and say, Lord, I'm not utilizing the gifts you've given me. Forgive me and, and help me. Help me to plug in. Some of you are using some of the gifts God's given you, but God has given you other gifts. God is calling on you to develop new gifts that He wants to have in your life. He wants to grow you. He wants to keep maturing you. I'm a firm believer of not only the seasons of the year, but the seasons in life. There are times that, that some gifts come into our lives for a season, and that season closes, but there's a new season that opens, and there's a new giftedness that God gives you because He has more plans for you to do. Some of you need to be seeking the new gifts. You know that that gift is closed. That season is done. But there's a new season that's open. And God wants you to utilize a new gift. He's given you new opportunities. Your call to make Him known has not ceased until your last breath is taken on this earth. And until that time, He's got a purpose for your life. That purpose is utilizing the gift that He's given you to help make Him known. In the sermon outline online, which it's listed how you can get there in the in the bulletin. 
I give you the passages that I'm about to refer to. So if you can't write them down quickly, it's online for you to look at. But let me give you a charge that Scripture gives every Christian, okay? Every Christian is created for ministry. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Every Christian is gifted for ministry. 1 Peter 4, 10. Every Christian is saved for ministry. Okay? That's the purpose of your salvation. It is not just so that you can sit there in that salvation, but so that through your salvation you can help make God known. Every Christian is saved for ministry. Ephesians 2, 8-10. Every Christian is called to ministry. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Every Christian is... There we go. Every Christian is authorized for ministry. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Every Christian is commanded to minister. Matthew 20, 26 through 28. Every Christian is needed for ministry. Ephesians 4, 16. And every Christian is accountable for ministry. Colossians 3, 23 through 24. So if you're a Christian here today, you're a believer, you proclaim the name of Christ. And you're not joining in in the ministry of Valley Grove Baptist Church where God has called you to be a member, where God has called you to be part of the family of God here. Why not? If you're a Christian, you're called to be here, why have you not joined in in the ministry of God? You're called. You're authorized. You're gifted. It's the purpose of your salvation to live out those gifts and to make God known. You're going to be held accountable for the utilizing of the gifts. What's holding you back from joining in in the ministries of this church and utilizing the gifts that God has given you? And whenever you come up with the best answer you've got, pray and ask God if that answer is good enough. Because I suspect that the truth of His Word is going to override and say, I've gifted you and I've called you and I've authorized you and I've commanded you, go get busy. Go get this. Some of you say, you know what, Brother Lord? I don't know what my gifts are. I don't know what God's called me to do. Okay? There are 25 packets of the spiritual gift inventory right there at the back of the church. The way out you grab it. When you get it filled out, you come back to me. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's see how God has gifted you. And let's find a place to plug in. See, it's not always the responsibility uh, of the leadership of the church to, to come and ask you, hey, would you do this? Quite honestly, the onerous of Scripture says that there's a preparation that happens, but for all believers to be involved in and buy in in the service of the church, we need you to come to us and say, hey, you know what, God's gifted me this, in this way. Can I jump in here? How can I serve? How can I utilize the gift that God has given me? See, there's this partnership that happens. And for the healthiness of this church and for us to fulfill the purposes that God has for us, we need to be all in. And I want to tell you that in many ways we are. But in many ways we can improve. In many ways I can improve. In many ways you can improve. Because God's not done with you. Man, you're great. But you're not done. Even the Apostle Paul says, not that I have attained it, I keep striving. We need to keep striving. Why? Why, Brother Lord, do we need to work so hard? Why, Brother Lord, do we need to sacrifice? God has already blessed us with salvation. Why is it we need to do this? Because that's the very reason He's blessed you with salvation. So that you can help be that ambassador for Him to help make Him known. Because there's other people in our world dying every day without the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They don't face an eternity with God. They face an eternity away from Him. And I pray that the love of Christ in us hurts at that thought. I pray that the love of Christ compels us to jump all in with the giftedness He's given us to fulfill the purpose He's called us to. Church, I know, man, these are hard words. These are like, man, I don't feel like I'm doing things right. You know what? We can always do better. We will always strive to do better. Don't quit. Don't hold back. What God has gifted you to do, you do. He's called you to do it. 